So it's a pleasure to have uh, the panelists here for the NAMPI or the Neural Abstract Machine and Program Induction Workshop. Um, it's uh, an area which is uh, quite exciting and uh, uh, is very active, as you can see from the number of uh, papers uh, that were presented during the poster session. Uh, so I would start the panel by uh, just asking uh, each of the panelists to introduce uh, themselves and sort of um, talk a bit about uh, their interests in this area and uh, what they have done in the, in the past on this topic. So I, I'll start with Armando. Hi, so I'm Armando Solar Lezama, and I came to this area from the point of view of automated programming. This was really the motivating application for this. But recently, we've gotten really excited about its potential not just to automate software development, but also of the use of programs as a mechanism for general learning and as a powerful representation for uh, knowledge. And so this is, this is an area that we're really excited about. Okay. Hi, I'm Percy. I've been thinking about kind of, um, kind of gone into program synthesis a little bit tangentially through, mostly through kind of uh, semantic parsing and natural language. So that, of, you know, these days, I guess you could think of it as a natural language to um, code. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in the kind of the learning problem of how you can, um, without kind of uh, supervision about uh, the, the programs themselves, try to infer them from kind of some sort of weak signal like the execution of the program and uh, how to, you know, use machine learning inside that search procedure to learn how to kind of search better. I'm Brendan Lake from NYU, and I spoke earlier today about a few applications of program induction and how it's been very useful for us to understand concept learning, how people are able to learn a, a new concept from a very small number of examples and then generalize to different tasks, and also creative capabilities like generating new concepts or asking questions, and uh, future work coming about uh, compositional learning. So I think program induction is well suited for explaining all these abilities, both from the perspective of machine learning and cognitive science. I'm Sumit Gulwani from Microsoft. So I lead a research and engineering team that develops many program synthesis APIs and embeds them into different Microsoft products. So earlier I talked about in my talk the most defining moment of my research career where I realized the need to be able to help non-programmers to be able to create or author scripts. So earlier I used to work on helping synthesize complicated programs, large programs. But then I noticed that there was a huge market for synthesizing small programs that many people cared about. But the new challenge here was that the intent was quite ambiguous. And this is what got me into this uh, end user programming game. And the other topic that I'm also very passionate about is intelligent tutoring systems or personalized learning. So it turns out that many of the techniques that we deal with, that, that we have developed in the area of program synthesis around dealing with ambiguities, or trying to explore huge combinatorial search spaces also have a great application in, in intelligent tutoring systems. So these are the two areas that really excite, excite me. Hi, I'm Josh Tenenbaum from MIT. And uh, I guess you, you saw some of the work that uh, I've been involved with in some of the speakers and posters here. Um, I would say that my interest in program induction and program synthesis is if we want to have a general framework for thinking about learning, either learning in machines or learning in humans from a computational point of view, I don't really think there's any alternative, right? I mean, if we want a fully general universal framework, I think it's reasonable to say that all the, you know, we're talking about how you acquire knowledge, then all knowledge is some kind of program, and so all knowledge acquisition has got to be some kind of programming. Um, I think, you know, maybe the advocates of deep learning, I mean, just sort of generic, straight on deep learning might say, oh yeah, that's the same thing and it's a differentiable program, but I, the way I see it is that we shouldn't limit ourselves to any particular kind of program, such as one that's end-to-end -end differentiable. I think if you look at um, you know, just the full space of all the programs that humanity has written, it is just clearly our best formal expression of the knowledge that we've evolved biologically and culturally, and there's a lot more of that lurking inside our head, which you know, is some kind of program. So if we want machines that can build 
either explain how we build the knowledge that we do or build new knowledge, then I just think it's, you know, it's, it's, there's no alternative. And um, someday, <laughs> I guess ICML will maybe be ICMPL or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm also, I mean, no, I mean, I just, I just think it's, it's going to take over the field because there's no alternative. Um, and um, I, I'm, also, I'm especially excited also by, by the coming together of uh, the machine learning and programming languages community as this panel uh, represents. Um, I sometimes say, you know, Armando and I are colleagues at MIT, I sometimes say to many people, um, Armando is the most important AI researcher at MIT that you haven't heard of. Um, <laughs> it's not that people haven't heard of him, it's just that they, people don't normally think of him as an AI researcher, but, but I think the, the toolkit that he has and that he's bringing together and, you know, the, some of the stuff that students working with us, like, like Kevin Ellis, who some of you met, are trying to do, is... Um, you know, to, you know, to me, I just, I'm, I, I, I'm not shy or I feel no shame in saying that I think that is really the future of not just machine learning, but AI. Great, uh, actually, uh, so hi everyone, I'm Rishabh, I work at Google Brain, uh, and actually, I'm passionate about program synthesis pretty much for all the reasons if all the panelists have already said. Uh, I'll just briefly add that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll also completely agree, I think this, uh, programs gives us a, a, a way to represent computations, and we don't have any other be better way to, uh, to to both concisely represent, and then we have machinery to be able to execute those things. And uh, in some sense, yeah, programs are these general form computations that encompass all kinds of models that we already have, and, and the models that we'll have in future. So, so in some sense, yeah, this is truly the future, and and to be able to. Uh, be able to learn programs of various complexities going forward would would uh, would really uh, uh, enable the kind of true intelligence people talk about. So, so, so that's why I'm really excited about. So my name is Pushmeet Kohli, and I'm uh, at DeepMind, and uh, I've um, my background is in sort of optimization, and I uh, and. I started off in the formal methods community, but somehow accidentally sort of ended up in the machine learning community, which I thought was a very uh, good final sort of uh, outcome. Uh, I have been inspired by uh, the papers and the work that uh, most of the people in the panel sort of uh, have done in the past. Um, and so it's really sort of an honor to have all of them here uh, uh, in this group. So. Uh, with regards to this uh, panel, I would start with asking a few questions, and then it would be sort of audience uh, questions. So please, uh, so the microphone is here. So if you have any sort of questions, please uh, sort of um, uh, ask the panelists uh, your questions. So um, I'll start with the first sort of uh, topic that we could discuss, which is uh, this panel sort of represents uh, a very multidisciplinary side of this sort of topic. The program synthesis has been uh, sort of worked uh, worked on in the uh, in the program languages community in the Paul methods community for a long time. Uh, people uh, in cognitive science have look, looked at program induction and so on, and then the, in uh, natural language processing, people have looked at semantic parsing, which is a sort of a related uh, sort of concept, and then uh, again in machine learning as well. So. Um, in your view, in, in sort of the developments that you have seen over the last uh, few years, what are the most sort of interesting and exciting uh, sort of ideas that you think uh, from some other discipline than yours can have uh, an impact on your, your work, right? So what are the, the, the interesting ideas that you might not have been familiar uh, with, or I think there is not a, a big appreciation in your own community uh, of, of an idea which uh, is quite prevalent in some other sort of community. One, one sort of uh, idea is that in the pro programming languages community, while there has been a lot of work on symbolic search, uh, differentiable sort of representations is, is something which is sort of, in my opinion, uh, was quite new, right? Uh, the exploration of the, these sort of topics. So, um, so maybe the panelists would like to comment on this, uh, on this question. Amanda. Well, so I think certainly the idea of leveraging numerical search for, uh, for a lot of these problems was very foreign to the programming languages community. I think uh, when, when we first started publishing some of these work around using numerical optimization techniques over programs, it, uh, it was really considered to be quite foreign. And to give you an idea of how foreign this idea is in the programming languages community, we submitted a paper at some point 
where we were talking about using numerical, uh, using automatic differentiation and uh, gradient descent in order to find parameters for programs. And the, one of the reviews said something along the lines of, well, so you mentioned neural networks at the beginning of your paper, and you mentioned them in the related work, but I just don't see what they have anything to do with this work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you sort of realize that things that in one community are just taken for granted are, are actually quite foreign in, uh, in another. And I think one of the things that is really exciting about this area is that there is this convergence of techniques, not just from formal methods and programming languages and machine learning, but also I think it's an area that is very application driven. And I think there's also a lot of insights that come from the specific application domains mm -hmm. where we actually go and apply these, uh, these techniques that are also very valuable. I think. So I think the, if the end goal, I, as I see it, is kind of to enable you know, humans, users, to actually be able to um, get more things done via programs, then I think an important um, part of this is kind of thinking about the user interaction. So one thing that I've actually um, thought has been maybe not the, the thing that comes to mind the first when you think of a program induction is, you know, kind of the work that has been done in, in you know, the HCI or human computer interaction uh, community where they've actually um, forged ahead and thought more, more, much more carefully about kind of the types of, you know, interfaces or, you know, pr because program induction is also, or programs in general is a very general, you know, topic and I think, you know, to get footholds on it and figure out where it can be most kind of useful is, um, is an important thing. Um, so, you know, thinking about, uh, for, kind of, for example, you know, the discoverability, what is your input? It should be natural language, are there visual elements, are, is it interactive? And all those things are kind of uh, important. This also, I think, touches a bit on um, the cognitive science uh, side of things where you have to understand the, um, the, the kind of, the, the user has a mental model of, I mean, uh, the, what the system is capable of, of, and it's very easy to design systems which, you know, okay, here's a data set of programs, you can synthesize them, but, um, but when you actually have a real user using a system, you know, in our experience, it has been quite a uh, different matter. Yeah, I've been very excited about how the deep learning community has really embraced program induction and is thinking about creative ways of creating hybrid architectures and models that find interesting ways of fusing what we could do well in deep learning and, and program induction. And you've seen all sorts of variants, and I think this workshop as a whole is really emblematic of, of the interesting intersections in terms of neural networks learning implicit, implicit programs or producing symbolic programs or uh, all possible combinations will probably have uh, program induction systems producing neural networks soon and or incorporating neural networks into the structure of, of um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, probabilistic programming. So I, I think that creativity and, and also uh, the, not being afraid to explore new ideas at the interface of these fields is, is uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it. So I come from a formal methods and programming languages background um, as well. And uh, initially I used to do a lot of work on synthesizing programs from full and complete specifications, logical specifications. Um, and this, this in way of interacting with uh, computers by specifying your intent using examples was actually quite alien to the PL community initially as well. In fact, when I submitted the flash fill paper to Popple, uh, one of the, so they brought in a machine learning reviewer and the reviewer said, you know, great paper, but we should not accept it through this conference. It doesn't look like a good fit. It should actually be submitted to a machine learning conference. Fortunately, the paper did uh, get in after that. And uh, so I remember Rishabh was uh, an intern around that time, and uh, uh, we did a lot of work on uh, ranking programs so that we can learn from one example. So the Excel team told us that Flashful is not going to shape unless you make it work from one example in many common, simple cases. And then we had this paper that we submitted, I think, 
to three different conferences. It got rejected because the people in the community said, what's the big deal? You know, if you're going to give garbage in, you know, garbage should come out. And, and uh, why can't people write you know, three or four examples? And if you're reducing, the, how much load are you reducing uh, for the user? Uh, but this was actually very significant. Even today, if you go and look at some forums, people talk about, oh, Flashful is not working with one example. They don't even know that they can give a second example. The data set contains data in two different formats. Uh, uh, and, and they do not know that you can give two examples. So Excel team was very right that in terms of building a good usable experience, um, uh, interaction is going to be every, very important. Every keystroke is going to be important. The HCI community realizes this, but the PL community apparently didn't have appreciation for it. Um, so initially, we, the work that we did in this space was uh, involved around you know, a lot of heuristics to deal with things, but then we slowly got around the way to phrase it as a machine learning problem. Uh, I also remember doing some work with Kevin Ellis uh, on this, uh, using output features and building machine learning models around it. And uh, I think one of the reviewers, the reviews came around was, so what's the big deal? Isn't this the standard way that you should be, folks should be doing things in the, in the, in the first place? So yes, so PL community is a lot about around, you know, initially around heuristics and uh, full specifications. Uh, and the thing to uh, learn uh, from many different communities was how to deal with ambiguity and how to phrase these problems properly as an, as an ML problem. And it took us you know, many years uh, for us to, you know, s for these thoughts to slowly uh, sink in. Yeah, well, just to add to many, I agree with everything that everybody said here, but all these ways in which ideas are crossing boundaries. So just based on what you just said, the, you know, there's also the probabilistic programming field, which is another but allied group and like so bringing in uncertainty and principled frameworks for dealing with uncertainty into you know program synthesis and induction and making it a kind of a Bayesian inference which is you know people decades ago could formulate that idea but to actually make it practical requires the tools of the PL and PL ML communities or another example is like I, you know I'm, I'm very excited to see the deep learning community um, the people who do want to sort of you know w once you realize that um, effectively deep networks are differentiable programs then, and, and you know, and you get to recurrent networks and other kinds of programs with somewhat interesting control flow. Then you start thinking about all sorts of other programs that can become differentiable, right? So just make it, just taking all sorts of algorithms and making them differentiable, that, that 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 when maybe they weren't before, or realizing that they are differentiable, which means you can integrate them into the loop. So, for example, in the RL community, by taking planning algorithms, and, and exploiting the fact that some of them might be differentiable or approximately, then that, that allows you to do much more interesting kinds of model-based planning, but in the loop of DeepRL. Or another area, uh, for those of you who saw me give the talk at the main conference, where I talked a lot about physics engines and intuitive physics using, say, game-style physics engines, well, increasingly, uh, just in the last you know, year or two, there's been a lot of interest in making differentiable physics engines um, so that they can be learned, so that we could get robots or other AI systems to be able to learn much more flexible kinds of intuitive physics, but without having to give up on what are the good properties of physics engines, like objects and events and relations, and the, you know, having the, keeping the symbolic core structure, which even infants seem to be sensitive to, but being able to learn the other parts of the engine. Yeah, I think I uh, also completely agree with all the points. Uh, uh, just to add to some of them, um, I feel uh, I think we have made lots of great progress both in both using deep learning techniques and using PL techniques to do program synthesis. But uh, the overlap or using uh, hybrid techniques, we haven't seen a lot of work, and and I, I I feel I think that's where a lot of innovation and next next generation techniques would come. So so maybe some some examples like how do we bring in this power of constraint solving or symbolic solving that that can solve millions of clauses now in SAT solvers in, uh, into gradient descent and, and also the other way around. How do we bring gradient descent based approaches inside SAT solving? So uh, I think we have seen, we have had uh, at least like lots of progress in both communities, but bring them together ideas uh, from uh, one to the other community and building hybrid techniques. Uh, uh, I think that's where the future is and, uh, and, and those things would, would define um, the next generation. Okay. So, um, if people have uh, sort of questions. Okay. We, we can start asking questions now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, there's a lot of interesting talk, uh, presentations and talks been given here. Uh, like, the, the one thing I didn't notice as much is 
uh, AutoML. Uh, well, there's a couple of them. And uh, architecture search for differentiable systems, because apparently in the last year there was plenty of papers about how to look for architectures which are essentially, I think, like the, the program induction, induction that came back to deep learning. Uh, so what you, what you thought on that uh, as it concerns to the program induction, like can it be kind of reversed when you use maybe something old school, uh, like symbolic stuff for developing differentiable pipelines or maybe, uh, yeah. So I, I guess uh, maybe uh, Percy can start uh, answering that. <laughs> I could only, I could hear like 70%. There seems to be some sort of uh, echo. But I guess the, the question is, can you bring kind of more older school, uh, sorry, sorry, can you bring kind of more differentiable techniques to the problem of neural fanny architectures? Is that uh, I think the, the, the question was also about, uh, I think it touched upon uh, the relevance of program synthesis or program induction in the context of uh, um, Auto ML or sort of learning to learn in some sense, right? And so, yeah. um, so from a meta learning or a transfer learning sort of perspective, or or, or from a meta learning perspective, like what, what is the role of program synthesis or? Uh, or yes, exactly. Uh, so it's like kind of converges. Auto ML looks like architecture search, and a lot of stuff here is using a data set as a data point now. So it's like one uh, tier above. So what's your thought on that uh, as like a new normal, I guess? Yeah, um, I think, you know, I mean, certainly the, the types check, right? So you have, if, if you think about program as generally construed any sort of computer structure where you can execute, which might be learning a model and you get some reward out, then you, it's a search over kind of the highest um, uh, scoring program. I think there's some interesting differences, which is that, you know, you might imagine the cost function for architecture search to, in some sense, be a bit smoother. It seems like people have bugs in their deep learning code where they think uh, stick too many layers or too few, and it kind of the training kind of smooths things out, which perhaps makes it a kind of a you know easier problem. Then I think some of the typical things I think about in program search is that you're kind of finding a needle in a haystack. You're kind of basically nothing even works fits the training data and then all of a sudden you find something. Um, what I'd like to actually see more of is uh, on the kind of architecture search side, if there's kind of generating, I haven't followed it too closely, but if it would generate kind of insights, for example, you know, um, when attention mechanisms came out, you know, that was kind of, you know, that was a, that was a paper and it kind of led to kind of a, um, open up a kind of possibilities of you know, generating, you know, basically doing seek to seek like things. Are there, and we know that current architectures are um, incapable of doing some things like, you know, for example, memory is something that's, I think people are so struggling with and um, also maybe issues of even robustness. Um, could we actually use these uh, architectural search uh, techniques to maybe um, search uh, over the space, uh, kind of a large enough space and um, where it's not like just locally optimizing things for better uh, accuracies on, you know, um, ImageNet or something, but actually to help us uh, design kind of new things. One of the things that excites me most about program induction when is when it actually finds something that I found unexpected. So we were doing this program synthesis from examples, um, and, um, you know, it was, we had some, like, you know, the, uh, well, I don't remember exact precise. There was one implementation, um, and then it it came up with another one, um, and it it looked not the one that we intended, but it was actually um, a new mathematical identity um, involving you know trigonometry. And I thought, wow, this is when you know that's that's kind of exciting when there's uh, um, the program that you get actually not is is not just solving the downstream task, but actually gives you additional insight. Uh, I guess, uh, Brendan uh, and Josh, I mean, you have particularly looked at sort of this uh, question of learning to learn and sort of having inductive biases and so on. So uh, would you like to comment on uh, sort of the role programs in this can play on this sort of topic? 
Yes, I, I think it's a very natural intersection between meta learning or learning to learn and program induction. I, I didn't see too many papers on this topic at, at this workshop in particular, but I, I see them as fitting very well together and is uh, also very important for, for um, my work in the past and my work with Josh, where especially for trying to tackle this problem of how people can learn a handwritten character from a single example. What was absolutely key there, if you're trying to synthesize a program from a single example, is that you have a strong prior, and in part that's informed by other programs that you've learned from related characters or background characters. And what's uh, very uh, compelling about this idea is that you can quickly synthesize a new program, perhaps some very little data, by building on the pieces of what you already know. And I think in that way, the ideas fit together uh, very nicely. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. But I, I think, um, you know, real AutoML is not, we don't have it yet. <laughs> or or like the, 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 the real interesting potential of the field is, is far from being exploited. Um, and, so, and I think actually it might be because we need more of, more progress on this PLML <laughs> stuff for that. I mean, I think, you know, right now, when at least the AutoML I've looked at, it's mostly sort of, sort of searches within the space of architectures that people already know about, but it's not actually like inventing fundamentally new architectures. It's, it's like, you know, it's sort of a fa fancy kind of hyperparameter search almost, at least in most systems that I've seen. Whereas I think the real potential is actually to do some kind of automated programming of ML algorithms. And so, you know, I, I would encourage people in this community to work on that as one of the main areas where you could have real impact. So essentially you're saying like people making architectures from Legos, but we need to go to like Mindstorm, you know, like where building blocks or are. Or chemistry or material science. Oh, yeah. Or, or, no, or, or Mindstorm, yeah. Or, <laughs> or um, you know, it's, I mean, it's not even from Legos. It's more like, um, I don't know. It's like, it's like you have several Lego kits and you can mix up the car from this one with the thing from this and maybe buy a few extra of that kit or how many of those kits do you want yeah but I mean but, you know what Percy said about like the magic of any kind of machine learning is when your system learns something that you didn't think about or know about before um, and that happens very rarely <laughs> but um, hopefully that might start to happen more and I think that especially would be nice to see that in the in the auto ML world yeah and I think one of the things that it's important too in this space is that you know, there's one level of doing this, which is essentially, okay, there's this big search space, there's this big combinatorial search space, we know that we have this objective that we want to learn more efficiently and we'll just go at it. But I think if you really want to get true auto ML, you really need the ability to reason more abstractly about this problem. So you actually need to have a higher level way of reasoning about what different components, what this different building blocks can bring to the table. And it doesn't have to be precise, right? If you think about people inventing new algorithms, a lot of times they start with a cartoon of, of how different components might behave, might interact with each other. But this is a cartoon that now has, gives you the basis for a mental model that then you can iterate, you can experiment, you can refine your mental model. And that's the kind of process that true synthesis, I think, really requires. And we don't really have a very good handle as to exactly how to do that. So we, you know, one other dimension that I would add uh, here would be to think about uh, interactivity as well. So instead of you know, doing things completely automatically, so let's say you know, I'm trying to extract Kohli from Pushmeet Kohli. Right? Is the program extract the second word? Is it extract the last word, extract everything after the first space? So any of these can actually be a very fine program, but it would be good to look inside the data set and see if there are names with three words or there are names with a hyphen in between them, in which case these different interpretations would uh, uh, start differing from each, each other. So instead of putting all of our energies in trying to automate this stuff, there is also a potential to make interaction a first class uh, uh, concept. And a lot of interesting research can be done in this particular setting. So specifically, if you take the example of flash fill, uh, you can imagine leveraging different kinds of clustering techniques over the input uh, data set to identify what the different corner cases are and use that to drive the discussion uh, with the user. Um, yeah, I think uh, AutoML seems like a program in this problem, but I think the current models we, that we have for deep learning uh, are not sufficient. 
uh, in the sense, let's say if I propose a network, it takes me one day, two day to train it. There's no, uh, we don't have formalizations yet to say this architecture is better than this. It's all about just train it up to some time and then we'll, we'll see. I think we need better algorithms to formalize both uh, what a network is and some guarantees about what the accuracy bound would be. Then I think then we can build a loop on top to do search and do. So I think there's a lot of interesting work needs to be done there if you want to use synthesis to. Yeah, so I think that the, like uh, the the panelists touched on a number of sort of interesting topics. Uh, like you, we don't, uh, we are aspiring for auto ML, right? But even sort of interactive ML, making the process of doing machine learning sort of uh, uh, like somehow making machine learning easier, is a worthy sort of goal in in towards that sort of uh, uh, towards that outcome. So I guess we can take uh, Richard. So this question is pre uh, predominantly um, targeted at Brendan and uh, Josh. Because it's about one of the things I find very exciting about your work is this idea that when we synthesize a program, we're sort of learning new high-level concepts. That, and but from the one view of concepts that I'm particularly um, attracted to is sort of inferentialism, the idea that we understand a concept because we understand a set of inferential rules, and the and the concept, the word makes sense in this set of inferential rules. So. So the way I would imagine that we're going to generate a concept is by generating a set of horn clauses, declarative rules, in which this concept is interrelated to others. But actually, if I look at a lot of your work, it's, it's about synthesizing programs in, not in logic programs, but as uh, functional programs or imperative uh, programs, where it's less clear to what extent these are concepts that are being synthesized. So this is, of course, a very opinionated question. I mean, if, if, when I think of synthesizing concepts, I think, I think of synthesizing rules because a, a, a clause, right, a, a logic clause, has a truth value. It, it's a candidate for a belief in a way that I put it to you, an imperative function can't be a belief. So I'm just wondering what your view is on that. Yeah, this is also very relevant to sort of uh, Armando and Josh's work with, uh, with Kevin. Uh, who, who would like to go first? Sure, yeah. Um, well, it, it might be. The, diff the terminology here is difficult, and a, a concept as thought about in cognitive science is an extremely complicated entity that I think means all these things. Certainly what you're talking about, that a concept doesn't exist in isolation, it does exist in a system of other concepts and rules help connect them and give them meaning, and you know, meaning really does happen in the interaction between all, all of the things that you know. Um, at the same time, uh, you can't represent most concepts at purely as logical rules, and, and that was you know, the thinking in, in uh, the, the 70s in psychology that you just write down necessary and sufficient conditions for you know, what it means to be a chair or a cat or, um, or, or whatever. And you know, that, so that project, I think, um, is, is not going to succeed, and, and you know, we've, we've moved on, but it, it does, relate to current trends in, in some sense where that there is there is something right about having a a core sort of logical foundation to a lot of the concepts that we have and I think that actually probabilistic program programming and, and um, probabilistic program induction is one way of modernizing that idea where it's not just a rigid set of definitions but there's a tendency there can be exceptions but you do get the sort of compositionality that um, is very attractive about that view. So, so I, those, those are my thoughts on, on that. Uh, yeah, so no, I, I completely agree with your opinion. Um, I learned about concepts from Susan Carey, who is probably the biggest advocate for what you're calling inferentialism, I think, in cognitive science and inferential role semantics. Um, and you know, I, I would recommend, people have been asking me, what should I read in cognitive science? If you really want to read that kind of thing, you, know, you should read her book, on the origin of concepts. <laughs> do, do you know the one? No, no, oh, yeah. I mean, and it's sort of the basis, like Andres's poster over there, I'm not sure if you got to see it, but that was actually really the basis of it, which builds on, I think, some of the work that you've done and you're talking about. And, um, and he was influenced by Susan's class. Uh, so, you know, the idea that concepts are, you know, just as Brendan was saying, you know, I think it's deeply, I mean, it's partly what led to some of your work here, right, is the way we think of concepts as no one concept has meaning on its own, but there's a system of concepts, and the role they play in the system is the best way we can say what it is to have that meaning, but it's really, no one concept has meaning on its own. It's like, what, what can you do with the system? And the idea that concepts, like that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea that for those who don't know it, that we don't build up concepts piece by piece from perception, you know, the idea that 
you know, the classical idea going back to Hume or Aristotle in some form, that we look at perceptual data and gradually abstract, but rather that we can synthesize whole new systems of thinking which then reinterpret how we observe things. I think that's you know, a very sophisticated um, understanding of the origin of concepts that only a group of philosophers and some, you know, people in semantics and some cognitive scientists came to in later in the 20th century. And it still isn't, I mean, it, it, was, it was a fundamentally new insight and it wasn't um, broadly appreciated. Uh, it still isn't broadly appreciated. In, in, in work that, that we've done in our group over the years, we've tried to get at that with different tools, somewhat inspired by ILP. Um, so we had a paper, uh, a former student in my group, Yarden Katz, did a paper with Christian Kirsting and others almost 10 years ago, actually, where we tried to build on some of these ideas using something like a kind of independent choice logic, but embedded in a hierarchical Bayesian idea, and various other things we've done, you know, kind of build on that. But again, I think, I think Andres Compero over there, that guy with the soccer jersey, <laughs> um, uh, is uh, probably waiting to get out of here so he can watch a soccer game, <laughs> along with probably everybody else in the room. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, but uh, you know, he, like I think he's trying to build on that set of insights from cognitive science and computation, but you know, put it put it in the context of a differentiable logic programming loop. Um, and I think really the same thing is true for as, as Brendan referred to in the probabilistic programming thing. So there's a chapter that Noah Goodman, Toby Gerstenberg, and I wrote called "Concepts in a Probabilistic Language of Thought," and it, and it's trying to tackle exactly that, that idea. So I think we're actually on the same page there, and I'd love for the rest of the community to uh, get interested in that, too. So another thing I like about the, so from the programming languages perspective, I think one of the things that, uh, for example, a representation in terms of uh, functional language with support for higher order functions and uh, very good support for reusability and abstraction, one of the things that it brings to the table is the ability to discover actually fairly general reusable concepts and uh, components. And that's sort of the, the widely recognized advantage of this kind of notation. But there's another one that is, I think, a little bit less recognized, which is that over the last 15 years or so, our ability to reason about programs and to ask questions about the behavior of programs and get answers about the behavior of programs. Everything from, you know, find me an input on which this program is going to behave like X, or does there exist an input where this program will do Y? Our ability to do that kind of analysis is at a point where that itself becomes a really important capability because once you're able to construct models in this programmatic representation, now all of a sudden that gives you the ability to query these models to ask what if questions, right? Not just, okay, what would happen if I now feed this input to my program, but also questions like, okay, is there an input that will actually cause the model to do this, right? Because that's the behavior that I'm trying to elicit. And so I think the expressiveness is really important, but also this ability to reason about the behavior of these programs is, is I think, a really new capability that we're just starting to understand the kind of implications that it can have for this particular agenda of modeling the world. So I guess we can move to the next question. Hi. Um, thanks for the, the workshop and all the talks. Um, my name is Michael Chang. Um, I have a question about the prior on programs. Uh, and I think, I guess, one, one thing that I seem to notice is that when we do, when we talk about program induction, we kind of assume a DSL. We also assume some prior on the pro how the programs are like ordered in terms in 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 how we search through them. Um, but I guess this question is motivated by uh, two observations. Like one observation was uh, from Brendan's talk, um, where you showed the human experiments on the concept learning. Um, uh, um, it was surprising to me that some of the human participants did not actually uh, produce the recursive program that you wanted them to produce, which made me think, is there something else other than like the simplest possible program in the in human prior on programs? Um, you also have a case where, um, like, it, it seems to me, that the, the second case is, the second observation is that compositionality doesn't seem to be enough uh, because let's say I wanted to write a program that can 
I, I think Andres's um, question earlier was was a pretty good one, which is you know how how do I define how, how do I check if a million three hundred sixty two was even or something? Um, if you have a program that checks if two is even, four is even, six is even, like it will take forever. Um, there there might be a way to do this a lot more simply. Um, if you if you try to formulate like if you try to formulate programs in terms of list programs or like lambda calculus where each number is like one, one plus one, one plus one plus one, one, one plus one, etc. Um, this is pretty inefficient to search over. So I guess my question to the panel is, um, what is your opinion on what uh, is the right prior over programs that we should use and when we search over these programs? Okay, who would like to take this, <laughs> the, the, the right prior question? Okay, so Sumit, I guess you have looked at it from a, uh, from a real practical sort of uh, perspective. Yes, so uh, I would say that one of the very underappreciated aspects, at least um, in program synthesis in our community, is the role of the underlying DSL that we end up uh, designing. Um, the exercise that I often go through here is to look at large number of uh, real scenarios and to come up with few different abstractions that can be composed to cover a large number of uh, the real scenarios that people uh, really care about. So, so DSL is one way to um, uh, induce this prior, and which I think is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, the important thing to, to to start with. And then on top of it, you can start. Uh, uh, using other uh, techniques based upon um, uh, what uh, set of compositions of certain operators in this DSL occurs more often uh, than the other. So we can use uh, different kinds of program features that talk about maybe how many times is this operator going to be important or what constants are used more often. So for instance, if you look at string programs or text manipulating programs, then being able to articulate the fact that uh, there are certain characters that are more often used as a delimiter and certain characters are not used as a delimiter. It's important to capture that. Uh, uh, zero to nine is a bunch of uh, uh, characters that are often replaceable with each other. They are characterized under a regular expression that is a digit class. Uh, similarly, A to Z, capital A to capital Z. Uh, so it is also important to start uh, learning or introducing these priors based upon what constants uh, occur, what size of the constants are usually more common. Some of these things can be picked up by uh, uh, machine learning techniques, standard machine learning techniques, if you have a large amount of data. Uh, but these are the two sets of priors that I have found absolutely useful in the work. You know, starting with the DSL, which sets up a hard bias. So you're not going to be going outside the boundary of this underlying DSL to search for programs. And then the other one is what I call the soft bias, which is uh, based upon what constants or what compositions of those APIs occur uh, uh, more often. Uh, but yes, so these priors are very essential to make the search real time. Uh, so uh, in many cases, you know, we want to uh, provide a sub-second experience to the user. And uh, these priors are also useful to be able to learn from a smaller uh, uh, amount of specification that the user has, has provided. And this is a system which is what I would say is something that would be, uh, uh, so Flashful is a static system, meaning its intelligence does not increase with time, right? So whatever priors we uh, hard-coded uh, through the DSL or by hand-tuned weights or by the ML models that we built, uh, it's fixed. Uh, the other uh, you know, level that you can take this to is when you can uh, start learning from the actions of the users or from other users uh, in a given organization. So if a user <coughs> wants to treat dates in a European format, and that's what they keep formatting their different dates to, uh, so after some interactions, uh, the system can apparently tune itself to that particular user's need. So the next time that they have a date to reformat, uh, we can work with just one example, or why even one example, right? just with zero examples. We can immediately suggest to them, aha, here's a date column, and it looks like you, know, you have often formatted your stuff into uh, European date format, so let me just suggest that as an uh, uh, operation uh, to you. Uh, uh, so both efficiency and ranking are critical uh, 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 for this. Uh, uh, you know, the, so those are the important, important reasons why we want to set up priors. And priors, as I said, can be set up in three ways. Right? One is a DSL, one is the static priors that you can set with whatever data that you have to analyze. And other one is that once you deploy these systems, just like a search engine, you know, there's a potential to make these systems become smarter and smarter, or maybe even more adapted to different uh, user workloads. Okay, so I think uh, Brendan and, uh, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll address the, the fractal uh, part of your question, which I, I think it's a very interesting case. And yes, as, as you pointed out, some of the participants generated the right recursive concept or the right example, and others generated something completely different. And it's very interesting to dig deeper and try to understand exactly what's going on there and what that means about the, the underlying prior on programs and whether you know, we're representing, we have the right DSL or what the primitives are for, for people. I think there's at least three possibilities in, in that case, and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, one of which is, and, and this, this is the one uh, that I presented, is, is that people just aren't searching long enough, and that's, that's the, the failure that you're seeing. Um, I think a, a more likely possibility is that we don't have the primitives exactly right. And so all the primitives for the model so far was based on you know, the commands that Turtle can make, and it's all about drawing lines edge by edge, but people have more complicated primitives like uh, shapes, like triangles and squares, and, and the, the, so the model doesn't have those built in, but you could do a much a more detailed job and try to figure out what, uh, and you, you need a much larger set of concepts than we explored, but you could dig in and try to see what, what those primitives are. And the third possibility is that it's, it's not purely symbolic probabilistic program induction, but there's, there's other processes, other learning processes going on too. And there could be multiple paths and you could be using a, a more similarity feature-based neural network approach that could be separate or interestingly integrated with the type of program induction model that we explored there. So both with the fractals, but also in other projects that in my lab were, we're actually taking the um, try to understand the primitives, try to understand the basic inductive biases that people have. And it's, it's a much harder project to do that. Again, you need a lot more concepts and, and you need to be systematic about the ways you test for the, the priors that people have. But if, if, this is, if the machine learning problem is one that people solve very well, this is a very interesting option that you can take is to figure out what the right priors are, if, if people are really good at the task, you can um, run experiments and, and see and try to infer what they are for our cognition. Okay, so I, I think we have a, uh, we have limited time, so we'll sort of quickly go through uh, other questions. Uh, Thank you. Uh, for my question, one thing I've noticed that's distinct in the programming languages and machine learning community, in the programming languages community, there's a strong bias for using and looking at uh, languages inspired by lambda calculus like Haskell and Coq, while in the machine learning community, uh, it's much more mm -hmm. common for people to use imperative languages like uh, Python or C++. Uh, besides the languages the models can generate, when it comes to the languages the users or researchers are using, that will also affect what problems they find easier or hard. Do you think the current usage of imperative languages in ML is better suited for ML, or other types of languages would uh, lead to easier progress for certain kinds of problems? So this is like related to uh, sort of uh, the, the question, the previous question, uh, and also a, a question that was asked in Richard's talk about uh, why data log versus prolog and, uh, and so on. Uh, I can add a little bit uh, to it, yeah. Um, so uh, the underlying language that you use uh, for uh, search may be a different one than the one in which you really want to emit out your uh, program. Uh, so there are many aspects, uh, so there are different aspects you know, behind the choice of those two languages. So the one that you use for search is important in the sense that can you use it to capture the user's intent? It can even be a declarative language. Um, uh, um, and can you capture the intent, and can you set up the right prior over it so that you can capture the intent as effectively as possible, from as few, little specification as possible and as fast as possible. But once you have captured the intent, whatever form of that language in, there are many other concerns that we have normally not talked about, um, uh, which relate to uh, how do you want to uh, convert that uh, particular intent uh, uh, into another language for execution purposes. So for instance, you might want to run the programs that you have synthesized on large amounts of you know, huge data sets. So now neural architectures will have a very tough time you know, competing with standard programs. So let's say uh, we synthesize a neural architecture for quicksort. 
uh, it will not be comparable in runtime efficiency and performance compared to a efficiently hand optimized you know, C++ implementation of QuickSort. So if the goal is to run those programs on uh, large data, performance becomes a very important objective that needs to be catered to. And there's a lot of work in the super optimization uh, community in programming languages where we focus on generating uh, uh, optimized you know, sequence of assembly language instructions. Specifically, if you think about developers and data scientists who might be using these program synthesis technologies for real, readability is going to become a very important issue. They're going to be basing many financial decisions, big decisions based upon the program that will be uh, 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 doing the computations. So now you want to generate code that is going to be very readable. So performance of that code is not as much of a concern, but readability is an important concern. Um, even choosing the right set of variable names, how do you even format that code before you present to the user is going to be important. So this will now depend upon what background does that person has or what languages do they normally use in their workflow. So if you're talking about data science, Python and R are very important languages. So we want to be able to generate readable code inside those languages. So it will pretty much depend upon uh, what are we targeting and what are the different objectives, you know, often unspoken objectives that need to be taken into account. So I think there are two aspects of the question. One aspect of the question is basically if there are different intents, like the, the specification inference, uh, the learnability, right? Some sort of languages are easy to learn. And then the third is interpretability, right? Certain DSLs are easier to sort of express. And then there's another question that if you have two task distributions, there might be one language which is suitable for one task distribution while another for another task distribution, right? And, and if the problems in the machine learning community and the program synthesis community are different, then it's natural that uh, like two different uh, types of DSLs uh, would be sort of uh, sort of selected. So uh, I guess like if somebody wants to sort of comment on uh, uh, sort of that. Well, so I think that uh, you'll find plenty of people in the programming languages community who will give you very religious answers to to this question. But I think in in practice, there's uh, you know there's a reason why there are so many languages out there, and it's because there's different languages have their niche and have their application for different places. For example, one of the reasons why in synthesis we tend to like functional uh, languages even if, for example, I personally don't actually use them during development very much. But for synthesis, they happen to be a really good target precisely because they're very restrictive. And they give you a lot, of, a lot more guidance as to when you're doing a search. They give you a lot more constraints, which is great when you're doing a combinatorial search, maybe not so great when you're just trying to get the thing to work. Uh, or when you're trying to get a particularly performant piece of code to, to run, right? The, the solver from our sketch synthesis system is written in C++, and I say that without embarrassment. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty good language for what it is. So from a natural language perspective, if you think about the ways that humans naturally uh, communicate their kind of goals and intentions, it's most easily characterized uh, kind of declaratively. And uh, this is kind of, you know, been, you know, linguistics as computational semantics kind of uses, you know, lambda calculus and other kind of first order logic as ways of, you know, capturing um, intent. So even if you were trying to give procedural instructions, like, you know, tell a robot to go to a particular place, at some level, I mean, uh, it's, it's still a declarative goal that you want to be, the robot to be in a place, and you're not specifying the low level actions. So I think there might be something kind of more fundamental to the ease of communication, as well as um, some of the search implications, which has been mentioned by Armando. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question. Hello. Um, so coming from a deep learning, machine learning background, there's a lot of respect and importance put on unsupervised learning. And it's really useful in computer vision, natural language processing, like you can use ResNet weights or word embeddings. But I feel like I've never seen any effective demonstration of unsupervised learning in the program synthesis uh, domain. So I was wondering if any of you guys have any ideas how we may one day leverage unsupervised learning. <laughs> I think that was, a, that was a controversial assertion. So I think I, I'll, I'll start with Josh. I, I think we, he might have, yeah. he might have well, some I mean, examples to give. Well, well, Kevin, Ellis, and Armando, and me had a NIPS paper two years ago that was called Unsupervised Learning as Program Induction. I think something like that. Is that about right? Is that what it was called? Un or unsupervised programs. So, but I mean, there's, ma I mean, there's many people, I mean, especially if, if you like probabilistic programs and you want to say, I want to, I see some data and I want to synthesize a probabilistic program, 
under some likelihood or Bayesian criteria, then that's just a classic way to think about unsupervised learning. It just generalizes unsupervised learning of generative models to the richer structure beyond graphical models, as most people mean by that, to um, program setting. That's just one example. We were doing some of that there. Um, over on his poster, he's doing other things there. Brendan's work is another version of that. I mean, it's one of the main things I've always been interested in, and so our group has done a lot on that. But it is true that you haven't seen as much of it coming from the programming languages community, and that is yeah. partly because doing unsupervised learning really fundamentally requires a probabilistic view of the problem. Data distribution. Exactly, right? right? And, and that is something that doesn't quite come naturally to a lot of these sort of more traditional uh, PL-based uh, program synthesis approaches. And so I think this, this is really one of those settings where the combination of the programming languages-based techniques with the probabilistic perspective is really important in attacking this problem. I mean, there's really three perspectives that are coming together, and there hasn't yet been a single meeting where they've all been there and as full equal citizens in a great summit of AI, right? Like, there's the programming languages perspective, there's the probabilistic perspective, and there's the kind of deep learning neural net perspective, right? And, you know, since AlexNet, um, probabilistic and unsupervised approaches have been kind of second class citizens mm -hmm. in deep learning. GANs have started to bring that back, and of course with VAEs, but, you know, it's like the, when the PL people first started working on things with, you know, in, in, in your work, you know, a lot of it was, yeah, your sort of supervised training or supervised tasks rather than unsupervised learning. So what we really need, maybe for the next such workshop, um, I don't know if anybody's proposed something like that for NIPS for this year, but, you know, PL meets uh, probabilistic programming meets ML and it's full. And HCI form. even. <laughs> Human-computer interaction, bounded rationality and sort of... Uh, so I, I would like uh, one more comment, right? There is uh, some sort of uh, symbolic uh, sort of uh, structure inference. Uh, some of the work that uh, Josh and I did with ja uh, Jajun Wu, who is uh, Josh's student, is about sort of un like looking at programs, what role program synthesis can play in for unsupervised learning. So if you have uh, uh, images and you wanted to reconstruct them, but now you have a decoder, which is a rendering engine, can you automatically infer the symbolic representation that goes into uh, uh, sort of the, the rendering engine that produces the image, right? So uh, there is uh, that type of uh, work as well. So Rishabh, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, work happening now on, on trying to come up with program embeddings that work across tasks and, and also uh, uh, try to train it in unsupervised way so that they transfer well. Um, across multiple tasks. So, something, yeah, so something like word embeddings for programs. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a couple of there are a couple of papers recently, and there's a lot of other work happening. Yeah. So I think we're going to see more and more work going forward. Um, so uh, I like some perspectives from, so to, today we saw two different, uh, at least two different viewpoints about the connection between uh, ML and PL. One was ML is used as an alternative to PL where you are synthesizing neural architectures, and the other one was ML was used in the uh, service of program synthesis to be able to more efficiently generate programs. So I will, I will mention my viewpoint with respect to the first perspective where uh, we are treating ML as on par with you know, program synthesis as a replacement for synthesizing standard programs, in particular synthesizing neural architectures. So there, uh, the most impressive work, so by the way, the work that I typically talk inside Microsoft is not even Flashful. I think the community is a little bit too much fixated on Flashful right now, but our most shiny demos inside Microsoft are around uh, extracting structured data out of semi-structured documents, so cleaning data up, you know, extracting data from web pages, PDF documents, log files, and so on. And when we first initially did this work, it was kind of supervised learning where the user has to provide some examples of the various fields that they want to extract, and then the system will end up constructing a parser for it. Uh, in the talk earlier today, I it, uh, briefly talked about and even showed a small demo around uh, being able to automatically st extract structured uh, information from the semi-structured documents with zero examples. So you're just given the lots of inputs uh, that have some implicit structure in them, and you want to be able to uh, realize that thing. And this is not just a you know, more shiny demo. It is absolutely important to be able to do this, because imagine these different documents might have tens and hundreds of fields. It would be impossible or, or very difficult for users to start giving examples of each of these fields. Or if you want to imagine environments where you want to put up some Q&A interface, you know, conversational interactions on top of these documents, uh, you want uh, the document to be converted into a structured table completely automatically under the uh, covers so that you can support some rich conversational interface on top of it. So being able to do this kind of unsupervised learning 
is very essential in some of these application domains. And then the other place where it arises is, is in interactivity, right? And I think of program synthesis, should, program synthesis should not be thought of as the task of simply producing a program. It should be seen as a task of helping author code, which includes you know, making some guess about the program, but also what is the next question that you want to ask to the user, you know, some kind of active learning. So that should be a part of the uh, problem definition here. So if you think about active learning, uh, then being able to look at the, all the inputs that you have and being able to cluster them into different categories and then ask questions based upon the corner cases or some other formats that you have is also very much an unsupervised learning problem because the user might not want to tell you, oh, you know, these inputs are looking similar, put them into one cluster or something, but you might want to do that completely on your own. So, 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 so we're we, we out of time. So, Pati, do, do you want to add something? Like Sure, just to give a kind of a clarification or a counterpoint to some of the things, um, decoupling probabilities from unsupervised learning. I think if you broadly think about unsupervised learning as I'm describing inputs, um, you can think about um, various forms of you know, grammar induction as um, super, so think about it as more support estimation of a distribution rather than a distribution itself. And for example, you know, we did some work with Alex Aiken uh, at Stanford about um, inferring uh, the set of valid uh, inputs to you know, a program. So there's no, we're not learning the, the program. The program already exists, but there's some sort of uh, set of valid inputs and some invalid inputs. And you know, there you can think about it as unsupervised you know, learning problem as well. Okay, so last question, and then uh, we'll sort of break. Yeah, uh, in today's talk, we see a lot of work that takes uh, input of the pair as training data, or they have a reward function or a evaluator of the generated program. Uh, my question is, uh, because there exists maybe billions line of existing code that human wrote, would you think that will be a uh, useful resource for the uh, program induction? Mm -hmm. uh, who wants to go on that? Can you repeat the question? I, I so basically, there are like billions of lines of human sort of code, which is available right uh, on the internet. So how can we leverage it uh, for all these different for making progress in this domain? So, Rishabh, do you want to? Yeah, I think that's um, uh, that's an ex excellent point. Actually, that also relates to some of the earlier question on DSL priors. So I think if we have human written code. Uh, that's definitely going to help us come up with the right abstractions, right priors about what are typical functions people use, how are they typically composed, what kind of structures do we need to design the DSL or, or, or our language itself. Uh, uh, the only issue is that uh, I think right now our, our techniques are still scaling up in the sense we are not at a stage where we can write uh, thousands of lines. Uh, so and, and, and actually, so, so that's why a lot of work has focused on more domain-specific uh, applications for which we don't have too much code. So for, especially in, in our cases, like that's why we need to generate lots of synthetic data to train our models. Uh, but, but, uh, but at least in some domains, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting work that has happened on analyzing GitHub data and learning models and then using it for, for example, Wesleyan was presenting some of that on using human-written code basis to, to, to both do program synthesis and also do other kinds of applications. I think it's a promising direction. So naively, if you were trying to solve a task and you just you know you implement um, some giant language model over a GitHub, it's not clear that that prior is the right prior for your task. But it seems like in order to support these kind of low uh, um, so the so information has to come from somewhere, right? And you know, it, if you think about the GitHub as a way to kind of define, um, okay, let me start over. So I don't know of any prior <coughs> over code such that if you sample from it, you look at these examples and these are like programs anyone would ever you know, create. I think everyone can probably agree with this because it's my capture syntactically correct program. If you're lucky, maybe some semantics, but there's a sense in which when you write programs, they're trying to do something and kind of there's a goal and kind of these uh, distributions that you know, I think we are familiar with in terms of uh, sampling from you know, prior distributions of programs don't really capture this kind of uh, this aspect. On the other hand, presumably all the code on GitHub are people trying to do things. So that feels like at a high level, we should be able to learn something um, from that. 
So I think there's certainly been a lot of really good research and really exciting work around this area of big code and around being able to see what you can learn from places like GitHub. Although I do think that when it comes to the problem of learning how to program and really learning how to construct algorithmic solutions to problems, it's, uh, it's a not a particularly good uh, resource, right? I mean, even when we teach students to program, we don't go and tell them, hey, here's GitHub, take a dive, and hopefully you'll learn how to program, right? And <laughs> there's, there's, much better, uh, there's much better, much more targeted resources. Uh, one of the problems that you have with GitHub is that if you look at most big code bases, most of the code, even in really good code bases, is kind of boilerplate-ish, uh, you know, not very high in information content kind of code. And so if you're actually trying to learn how to solve algorithmic problems, you're gonna have a very hard time, even in something like GitHub, actually finding the algorithms and finding the places where it's actually doing real work. So uh, we are sort of running out of time. We are over time, in fact. But I uh, wanted basically the panelists to just uh, sort of summarize, uh, in some sense, um, uh, what do they think uh, are the interesting sort of open challenges and the future research directions in, that, in their view, uh, researchers working in this area, students working in this area, should sort of look at. And I think that after that, we'll uh, sort of conclude. So maybe we, we start with Drisha first. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is definitely a very exciting area, and uh, I was actually very glad this workshop happened. Uh, I think it's, it, it, uh, actually the advances uh, will require close collaborations between programming languages, machine learning, uh, cognitive sciences, human computer interaction, multiple communities. Uh, and uh, actually, there, uh, I think we're just getting started in the sense now we have the compute power uh, to really go in and, and, and do things at scale. We are developing new and new algorithms, breakthroughs in, in all fields. And, uh, uh, and, and yeah, we're starting to see some, uh, some initial successes. But, but to get to the next level where we can achieve uh, as uh, the competence of uh, real programmers, human programmers, uh, yeah, I think it's going to require lots of innovations. But, but, uh, uh, but, but that's, why, uh, that's why I think, uh, I think all of us are here. So, so it's an exciting field to work on. Yeah. Josh? Yeah, I mean, again, I've said a lot, but maybe to sum things up from a slightly different perspective, um, the, the, you know, the approach that dominates learning right now in machine learning, in deep learning, is you, know, you could sort of sum up as it's, it's, uh, learning as rolling downhill. <laughs> um, it's very powerful. You know, rolling down a hill is a very reliable thing to do. If you start at the top, you'll get to the bottom. <laughs> it might be a little painful. You might, but you know, and it's it's so it's amazing that that such a simple thing can lead to so much. But when you, from a human cognitive science perspective, learning often is a lot more like thinking or planning. And if we want tools that will let learning be more like looking for something, having a goal, right? I mean, as Percy said, pro programming is about having a goal. And, but you know, so much of human learning, even in young kids, is about that. Um, we need tools that will let machine learning be more like thinking, planning, searching, exploring. And you know, I think uh, the tools of coding and programming are a uh, great fit for that, the best fit we have right now. So uh, I, I'll mention two, you know, short term and long term. Uh, so for the short term, I, I would say that uh, an interesting open challenge problem is how do we augment the toolkit for developers who are trained to do traditional software development, and how can they start using machine learning as a first class tool inside the software development process? So I'll just give you some examples here. Right? So many times when doing the process of software development, we are writing or authoring many different heuristics. So let's say I'm choosing some hash function. Well, I could have chosen, you know, many different choices exist. Uh, but ideally, the choice of such a hash function may also be determined by the data that is going to be passed to this hash function at, at runtime. So you can imagine having some kind of ML system inside your runtime system that can keep adapting uh, this hash function. Or uh, uh, I'm, let's say, you know, coding up a very efficient version of a, a sorting routine where the typical pattern is going to be to use recursive sort uh, up until the array size gets to a specific constant and then use a non-recursive sort there. So is this array constant 64 or 128 or 256? I might just choose anything you know, by my gut feeling, uh, but then it would be good if, if some kind of you know, dynamic profiling can be done and these kinds of things can be automatically updated. Uh, then for the longer term, I would say uh, uh, I believe that you know, we should start taking steps towards 
bringing programming more closer to uh, human communication, where uh, programming will really happen by combining different kinds of intent, multimodal intent. Uh, so how can we help uh, author or complete programs from test cases that the user might have written, or from comments that they have written, from some sketch uh, uh, of the code that they have written? So how can these concepts come together, and the compiler can translate that into, into executable code? very optimistic long term about the prospects of probabilistic programming and probabilistic program induction for capturing some of the most impressive feats of, of human intelligence. Uh, one, one major challenge I think we need to overcome for probabilistic programming and probabilistic program induction is that for those types of models, we use a lot of very simple parametric forms like Gaussians and multinomial distributions and Bernoullis and so on. And uh, what we, we need richer types of distributions that can capture richer types of dependencies and grow as your data grows and gets more complicated, much in the way that deep learning is very get, good at. And I think that this is an important challenge for us to, to overcome with those methods and one with, with a tremendous payoff. So I think we're all very excited about um, the prospects of programs. I mean, one thing that I think, but we're still, I think, far away. And I think if you look at the kind of the success stories, and, you know, just to use analogies, it's, you know, you, you can kind of complain about machine learning biz rolling down hills. Um, but on the other hand, these kind of, a, let's say, shallower methods do have this tremendously valuable aspect of being completely open-ended and kind of just breadth of coverage, right? You know, these, that's why it's been so dominant because they're so uh, you know, applicable to all sorts of different you know, problems. And I think one of the challenges for you know, programs is that as we see it, the, the, the types of applications are still kind of fairly narrow, you know, both in terms of the size of programs we can actually induce, but also in terms of you know, representation. There's you know, tasks that demand this certain type of structure. Um, I mean, certainly there's many kind of more algorithmic tasks which, for which it makes sense, but if you think about the broad goal of you know, um, intelligence or helping people solve problems, um, it's not clear that these kind of abstractions that we have today will be able to kind of cover you know, that space. Just one anecdote is you know, I've been working on semantic parsing for a you know, very long time, that of converting natural language into programs, and it's, you know, it's very... Com you know, compelling, um, you look at language, at least some forms of language, and it feels like, ah, oh, that should really be a, be a program. But, you know, there's, when you get real data of people asking types of questions, you know, many of them just fall outside your, you know, well-defined kind of nice little um, logical garden. Um, and, and that's kind of very frustrating, whereas kind of a more, um, broader approach, which is kind of more closer to data, has at least the ability to you know, do something with everything, even if it's not very um, deep. So I think if we want this community to grow, there has to be some sort of bridge to say, OK, well, let's open up. And maybe we're not as, um, you know, as you know, um, complete in a certain kind of domain, but we can you know, broaden. And I think that will. Um, inject some maybe new ideas and a bigger. Yeah, I think we're at the early stages. I think there's still a lot of hard problems to tackle to really fulfill the potential of this area. But I really do believe that we have the potential to transform what it means to program in a way that hasn't really been transformed probably since the automa automatic uh, coding system called Fortran. Uh, came in the scene, you know, many years ago now. And it's kind of funny, when that system came out, it was really billed as the automatic programming system. From then on, people would never have to program again. They would just write Fortran, and the compiler would just program for them. And, uh, you know, at, at one level, it sounds funny today, and yet, that's exactly what happened, right? What people called program back then is just not done anymore. It's just that the new thing was now called programming. But we really do have an opportunity, I think, to transform again what it means to program in a way that, you know, maybe 20 years from now, people will laugh when, uh, when they say, oh, you know, drawing things in a whiteboard is, uh, is programming, right? Of course that's programming. Yeah, we'll be programming in like uh, English UK or English US. <laughs> and there will be like confusions. 
<laughs> translating between those. Okay, so I, I, I think you would all agree this was uh, uh, really enjoyable. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, let's thank uh, the panelists again. Okay, and this is the end of the workshop. Uh, see you hopefully next year. <laughs>